Okay, guys, this is chapter 16, which is basically going to talk about how all of the systems integrate with each other. So we're going to start by talking about sensation versus perception. Sensation is when you are aware of the stimuli, so either external or internal, and it could be a conscious awareness or even a subconscious awareness where you don't even realize that you are sensing something. Versus perception, which is the actual conscious awareness and how we interpret those sensations. So everybody can have sensations, let's say, of temperature. But how we perceive temperature can actually be different. So how we interpret temperature. For example, somebody might think that 70 degrees is cold, whereas somebody else might think that 70 degrees is hot. So the sensation is going to be the same, so the stimulus will be the same, but our interpretation of that stimulus could be different. The modality is the uniqueness for each sensation, so it's basically what separates them. So what distinguishes one sensation from another? So each sensory neuron is only going to carry one type of message, so one modality. So we have temperature, pain, touch, hearing, vision, etc. But each one is only going to carry those types of messages. So we have two types of senses. We have general senses and special senses. General senses are somatic and visceral whereas the special senses are your senses. You know, the five senses that we always talk about. So we have smell, taste, hearing, vision, and equilibrium. So generally speaking, you can have either somatic, which are going to be your tactile, so touch, thermal, pain, and proprioceptive, which proprioceptive is awareness of where you're at in space, basically. Or you can have visceral, which are your internal organs. So you can feel pressure, stretch, if you're hungry, if you're nauseous, those kind of things. So a sensory receptor is where a sensation begins. It can either be a specialized cell, like it would be with vision, for example, or it can be the dendrites of a sensory neuron. So a particular kind of stimulus, which is any change in the environment, Again, it can be external or internal, and that's going to activate those sensory receptors. So, for example, if the temperature changes, those particular temperature receptors are the ones that are going to be activated. Other sensory receptors are not going to respond. And this characteristic is known as selectivity. So each particular sensory neuron is going to respond to one type of sensation. So four events usually occur when sensation arises. So you're going to have the stimulation of the sensory receptor, which, again, the stimulus is going to be picked up by that particular receptor. So a change in the environment has to occur, whether it's external or internal, and the change has to occur within that receptor's field. So in other words, sensory receptors for temperature which are located in your arm, are going to sense temperature changes that are around your arm, not necessarily temperature changes around your legs. So it has to be within its field. Then that stimulus has to be transduced. So the sensory receptor has to detect it and convert it into a graded potential, which means it's transduced. So transduction of the stimulus is going to involve first the detection and then converting that detection into an actual graded potential. Now, hopefully you remember from last semester that graded potentials can vary in amplitude depending on the strength of the stimulus, and they're not propagated. So the larger the stimulus, the larger the graded potential. Now, it's not an action potential we're talking about here. Remember, action potentials are all or none. We're talking about a graded potential. So the closer it is to the stimulus, the larger the potential is. So 
maybe you remember it's like dropping a pebble in a body of water. The closer to the pebble, the larger the waves, and then they kind of reduce as you go further and further from that stimulus. Same idea. And again, they're not propagated, so they're not going to be sent anywhere. The nerve impulse is going to be conducted. So when enough graded potentials occur, where a threshold is going to be reached in the first order neurons, which is just the first neuron in a specific tract, then the impulse will be carried and conducted to the brain or spinal cord. So you're having the stimulus occur. You are having it picked up by the receptor and converted into a graded potential. Once enough of those graded potentials occur, they can add up and actually be conducted. So then that impulse would be carried to the brain or spinal cord. Then we have to have integration happening. So the region of the brain or spinal cord has to translate that nerve impulse into a sensation. So a region of the central nervous system is going to integrate a number of these sensory nerve impulses, which will then result in your conscience sensation or perception. So stimulus occurs. It is going to be transduced or converted basically into graded potentials. Enough graded potentials will add up, reach threshold, and then the first order neuron is going to conduct that impulse to the brain or spinal cord where it's then going to be integrated so we can tell what that sensation is. So this is just showing you it starts at the sensory receptor. The sensory neuron is going to carry it towards the brain or spinal cord. It's going to be integrated, and we're going to be able to tell what that sensation is. So the response is going to go out the motor neuron and to the effector, which in this case is a muscle. So this is also called the reflex arc, which hopefully you remember from last semester. So five components of the reflex arc just to... Reiterate, sensory receptor, sensory neuron, inner neuron in the brain or spinal cord, motor neuron effector, which in this case is a muscle. So sensory receptors can be grouped into several classes based on either structural or functional characteristics. So we can have microscopic structure, which would either be free nerve endings or encapsulated endings. So free nerve endings are the endings that do not have any coverings. They're just kind of out there. So they don't have specialization. And they're basically, like I said, bare, uncovered dendrites. So pain, temperature, tickle. Versus encapsulated, which are actually enclosed in connective tissue. So these are for pressure, vibration, touch. They can be categorized by location. So... Either the receptors and the origin of the to activate them. For example, you would have exteroreceptors, which are near the external surface, or enteroreceptors, which are internal. Also, by the type of stimulus detected. So, nociceptors for pain, mechanoreceptors for pressure, and a variety of other ones that we'll go over. Again, they are selective. So each sensory receptor is going to respond to one kind of stimulus. Same receptor is going to respond weakly or not at all to other stimuli. So again, if you have sensory receptors for temperature, they're not going to respond to pain. Some receptors are simple, meaning they're associated with the general senses. Some receptors are complex, meaning they're associated with the special senses. Most sensory receptors are adaptable, meaning that they change in sensitivity if a stimulus is long-term. So, for example, if you get into a hot bathtub, you're going to get used to the water temperature, so you become less and less sensitive to the heat. So initially, when you get in that tub, it feels super hot, but then after a few seconds, you can kind of get lower and lower into it. 
or the same thing with a cold pool, for example. Some receptors can adapt more quickly than others, like touch and smell. It's the reason that you can't feel your clothes while you're wearing them throughout the day. Or when somebody walks by you that has super strong perfume on and then sits next to you, you kind of get used to the smell because your smell receptors adapt pretty quickly. Some receptors adapt more slowly, so that means they're going to remain sensitive longer. This is very important for maintaining homeostasis. For example, pain. Pain is almost for survival. If you can't feel pain, you're not going to know when something's wrong. Blood glucose. Very important to maintain that for homeostasis. So these receptors do not adapt very fast so that your body has time to notice that something's wrong and fix it. So receptors based on their location are exteroreceptors, which are near the surface of the body. These are going to detect changes in the external environment. And interoceptors, which are also called visceroceptors, because they are on the inside within your blood vessels and viscera. So they detect changes in the internal environment. Now these are mostly unconscious. You can't tell when your blood glucose drops, for example. You can't tell if um, your blood pH is off, for example. Initially, anyway. Um, proprioceptors are in muscles, tendons, joints, and the internal ear. And these are going to detect changes in body position and muscle tension. Um, so basically giving your brain information on where you're located in space. Your brain needs to be able to tell if you're laying down versus sitting up versus standing up, for example. So these are the receptors that give your brain that information. This is just a chart on receptors and the types of stimuli that stimulate them. So mechanical are going to be things like pressure, touch, sound, thermal, hot versus cold, of course, chemical, individual types of molecules, but chemical for the most part, and electromagnetic, electricity, magnetism, visible light. According to the mode of activation, they're very easy to tell what these are, except for maybe nociceptors. Um, so mechanoreceptors are going to be responsive to stretch or mechanical pressure. Thermoreceptors, temperature. Nociceptors are pain, so any kind of tissue damage. Photoreceptors, light. Chemoreceptors, chemicals. And osmoreceptors detect the osmotic pressure. And that becomes important, and we'll talk about that later in the semester. Okay, adaptation. So as I said, some receptors are rapid adapting, some are slow adapting. So adaptation in general is when the um, potentials decrease in amplitude while the stimulus remains there. So we have an accommodation response where the frequency of the nerve impulses that travel to the cerebral cortex in the brain is going to decrease over time, and the perception of the sensation is going to fade even though the stimulus is still there. So rapid adapting adapts obviously very quickly, and they're specialized for signaling changes in the stimulus. So smell, for example. Um, we gave the example with the perfume versus slow adapting, which continue to trigger, trigger those nerve impulses uh, as long as the stimulus is there. So again, pain, body position, um, blood pH, glucose, that kind of stuff. So we're going to focus on the general senses because chapter 17 actually deals with the special senses. So the general senses include cutaneous sensations, which a cutaneous membrane is like your skin. So it's going to be the receptors in the skin, in the subcutaneous connective tissue, in your mucous membranes, and the GI tract. Some body sites are going to have more than others. So, for example, your tongue and your fingertips have a lot of receptors, so they're going to be very sensitive. 
They are the dendrites of sensory neurons. They can be either free or have a capsule. The uh, pathway, you have the cutaneous receptors going to pick up the sensation. The nerve impulse is going to travel through a somatic efferent neuron to the spinal cranial nerve, to the thalamus, which is the integration center, to the somatosensory area of the parietal lobe and the cerebral cortex. And we will talk more about the brain in chapter 14. Tactile sensations are touch sensations because we have tactile receptors in the skin. So these are mechanoreceptors. On the picture there, you can see you have nociceptors, which are for pain. You have Merkel discs, which are tactile, so light pressure. We have Meissner corpuscles, which are very sensitive to touch. We have Ruffini corpuscles, which are stretch and pressure. And then we have Piscinian corpuscles at the bottom there, which are focused on deep pressure. So a Merkel disc will let you know if somebody is lightly touching you, and a Piscinian corpuscle is going to know if, let's say, they start squeezing your arm. Crude touch is the ability to perceive something has touched you. You really don't know where it is. You can't necessarily pinpoint where it is, but you know something touched you. So if you feel a fly go across your arm, for example, you know it touched you somewhere, but you don't really know exactly where you touched it. Discriminative touch is when you can recognize the exact point on the body that is touched. And discriminative touch is going to be different for everyone. Some people have closer discriminative touch than others. And that basically just means that the distance between their receptors is smaller. So you can discriminate that touch better, basically. Um, so Meissner corpuscles, again, dendrites are surrounded by connective tissue. These are located in the dermal papillae. They adapt rapidly, and they are involved in discriminative touch. So your fingertips, eyelids, etc. We have hair root plexuses, which are around hair follicles. So movement of the hair shaft is going to stimulate these. So again, if something goes across your skin surface, as in crude touch, these are going to be stimulated. They're rapidly adapting as well. Mergle discs are flattened dendrites near the stratum basale. They are slowly adaptive, so these are going to remain sensitive to the stimulus longer. And these are what are involved in discriminative touch. So these are what can help you determine where exactly something touched you. Um, type 2 cutaneous mechanoreceptors or Ruffini corpuscles are deeper in the dervis and they can detect heavy or continuous touch. Again, slowly adaptive, so they're going to remain sensitive to the stimulus longer. So for pressure sensations, you have stimulation of the tactile receptors in the deeper tissues. So the Ruffini's corpuscles, Piscinian corpuscles. Uh, pressure is going to be longer lasting than touch, and you can feel it over a larger area. So it's, you know, the difference between if you just tap yourself versus if you push your finger into your arm for longer. You can feel that over a larger area. So we have the type 2 cutaneous mechanoreceptors. And again, as I said, Piscinian corpuscles. Now, these are laminated corpuscles. Or laminated, sorry, laminated corpuscles. Uh, one dendrite is surrounded by a lot of connective tissue layers. And if you looked at that picture, you could kind of see the tissue layers wrapping around each other. They are rapidly adapting, which means that they lose sensitivity to that stimulus pretty quickly. Thermal sensations are, again, free nerve endings. Some respond to heat. Others respond to cold. Pain sensations. Now, again, this is a vital sensation to survival. It basically tells you that something's really wrong. It's an alert signal. So these are called nociceptors, are the pain receptors. 
These are free nerve endings and they are in almost every tissue of the body. So basically, tissue damage is going to release chemicals, which is going to stimulate nociceptors. And now remember, we have all types of tissue. We have bone tissue, epithelial tissue, connective tissue. So any type of tissue damage is going to release these chemicals and stimulate these nociceptors to cause pain. There is very little, if any, adaptation, so they remain sensitive for an extremely long time. And again, this is crucial to survival because if you couldn't feel pain, you would never know if you had a cut or if you broke something or, you know, anything was wrong with you. As far as types of pain, we have acute pain and chronic pain. Acute pain is sharp. It's very fast. It's localized. So you can tell where it is exactly. Um, it's carried by large diameter myelinated neurons versus chronic pain, which is slow pain and it will gradually increase. So it's like an aching or a throbbing. These are carried by small diameter unmyelinated neurons. And hopefully we remember the difference between myelinated and unmyelinated. Myelinated transmission travels faster than unmyelinated. Um, but it's very important, like when you go to the doctor and they will ask you what type of pain you're having. You know, is it a throbbing pain or is it a sharp pain that you can say is like right here? We also have superficial somatic pain, which is because of the nociceptors in the skin. And again, superficial means on the surface. Or we can have deep somatic pain, which is inside muscles, tendons, joints, that kind of thing. Visceral pain is in your visceral organs. And referred pain, with visceral pain, you can usually feel the pain in the skin covering the organ as opposed to the organ itself. The cerebral cortex basically misidentifies where the pain stimulation is actually coming from. So it's usually the area that's served by the same segment of the spinal cord where the pain is felt. So if you have a heart attack, for example, you'll feel the pain in the skin over the heart and your left arm because they're served by the same spinal nerves. Phantom pain is from an amputated limb. Basically what happens is the brain keeps receiving impulses from the remaining ends of the sensory neurons that are still present. So you'll feel an itching or pressure or tingling even though the limb is no longer there. So here are some common patterns of visceral pain um, that you can see. So again, two types of pain. Fast pain, this is your acute pain that is well localized. And it occurs so fast because, again, myelinated A fibers, so travels quickly. Slow pain begins after the stimulus is applied and kind of gradually increases over a period of time. Again, unmyelinated C fibers, so it travels slower. This pain can actually be excruciating and it often is accompanied with burning or aching or kind of throbbing. And as I said before, that's why it's important when your doctor asks you what kind of pain you're having to describe it accurately to him or her, because that can tell them a lot. How do we get relief from pain? Well, anesthesia blocks sensations of pain. So basically, you don't allow the message to get to the brain. You have general anesthesia, which removes all sensations and knocks you out, causes unconsciousness. Or we have spinal anesthesia, which removes all sensations below wherever the injection site is. And again, it's direct injected into the subarachnoid space, so like an epidural, for example. Analgesia decreases or blocks the sensations of pain. So it can block the production of prostaglandins, so the nociceptors will not be stimulated. It can block the impulse conduction down the neurons, or it can change the perception of pain by the brain. So now you no longer perceive the 
sensation as pain. The sensation is still there. It's just your perception of it that's changed. Proprioceptive sensations, again, in your skeletal muscles, very important because it's going to tell your brain where is your body at in space. So they're going to convey nerve impulses about muscle tone, movement of body parts, and body position. And again, it's important because if your brain doesn't realize that you're laying down, for example, it's going to be very difficult to get up and move around. Or if your brain doesn't realize you're standing up, that can cause other problems. This is just a summary of the receptors for somatic sensations. Okay, pathways. So the first order neurons are the first ones in line, basically. They're going to conduct impulses from the somatic receptors into the brainstem or spinal cord. So if it's a cranial nerve, it will go into the brainstem. If it's a spinal nerve, it will go into the spinal cord. So first order neurons, first in line. Second order neurons are next in line, and these are going to conduct impulses from the brainstem and spinal cord to the thalamus. Now the thalamus is the relay center. So all sensations except for smell go through the thalamus. And we will talk more about that in chapter 14. Here the neurons decusate or cross over to opposite sides. So that's why the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body and the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body. All of the somatic sensory information is going to go from one side of body to the opposite side of the brain. Third order neurons conduct the impulses from the thalamus to the primary somatosensory area of the cortex on the same side. So a sensation is going to come in. The receptor is going to pick it up. A first order neuron is going to take it from the receptor to the brainstem or spinal cord. A second order neuron is going to take it from the brainstem or spinal cord to the thalamus, where it's going to cross over, and a third order neuron is going to take it to the primary somatosensory area. We have some tracks that it's important to be familiar with. Posterior column tracks are going to carry impulses for, oops, sorry. Posterior column tracts, again, are going to carry impulses for proprioception, discriminatory touch, vibrations, and pressure. The two main tracts are the cuneate fasciculus, which your nerve impulses from the upper limbs, upper trunk, exterior head, and the gracile fasciculus, which are from the lower trunk and lower limbs. The spinal thalamic tracts, you have lateral and anterior columns carry impulses to the cerebral cortex for pain, temperature, itch, tickles, from, again, the limbs, limbs, trunk, neck, and posterior head to the primary sensory motor cortex on the opposite side from where the stimulation occurred. Because remember, they cross over at the thalamus. The trigeminal thalamic carries nerve impulses for pressure, vibration, pain, temperature, touch from the face, nasal cavity, oral cavity, and teeth to the primary sensory motor cortex on the opposite side of stimulation. And the spinal cerebellar carry nerve impulses from proprioception from the trunk and lower limbs from one side of the body to the same side of the cerebellum. Now, these are what allow us to maintain our posture, maintain our balance, and to coordinate movements so we can do things like walk. Somatic sensory neurons are not evenly distributed in the body. So the relative size of these regions in the somatosensory area are going to be proportional to the number of specialized sensory receptors and the corresponding body parts. Now, this funny little picture you see on the right-hand side is called a sensory homunculus. And basically, it's a map of the sensory part of the cerebral cortex. So you can see 
how much area is dedicated to these different sensations. There is also a motor homunculus, which is going to show you how much area of the cerebral cortex the motor activities are dedicated to. So motor activity is going to begin in the primary motor area of the precentral gyrus. And again, we will talk more about that in chapter 14. Any motor neuron that is not directly responsible for stimulating the target muscles is called an upper motor neuron or a UNM. UM, sorry, not UNM, UMN. UMNs or upper motor neurons connect the brain to the appropriate level in the spinal cord. So anything that doesn't go directly to the target muscle is an upper motor neuron. Anything that goes directly to the target muscle is going to be called a lower motor neuron. This is just showing you the view of the brain and spinal cord. So you can see the motor areas of the cerebral cortex at the top. The thalamus, again, is the relay center. And you have the brainstem, which you're going to have some motor centers in the brainstem. And then the cerebellum, which is posture, coordination, balance. Again, we're going to talk about these particular areas in Chapter 14. So we'll refer back to this at that point. Okay, so lower motor neurons, again, these are the ones that innervate the muscle directly. So upper do not innervate the muscle, lower innervate the muscle. So the lower motor neurons are going to provide the output from the central nervous system to the skeletal muscle fibers. For this reason, they're also called the final common pathway. So we have direct pyramidal tracts, and then we're going to have indirect tracts. So direct carry the nerve impulses for specific voluntary movements from the cerebral cortex. So these are conscious. The axons of the lower motor neurons are going to go through the cranial nerves to the skeletal muscles of the face and the head, and through the spinal nerves to innervate the actual skeletal muscles of the limbs and the trunk. Two of the major tracts are the lateral corticospinal tracts and the anterior corticospinal tracts. So the lateral is going to be movements of the hands and feet, and the anterior is the trunk and the proximal parts of the limbs, which remember proximal means closer to the point of origin. And here are pictures. The cortical bulbar pathway are impulses for the control of the skeletal muscles in the head, which, again, are going to be associated with cranial nerves because we're talking about the head. Then we have indirect extrapyramidal tracts. These are unconscious. They originate in the midbrain. Again, lateral and anterior columns. There's five major tracks, and they're going to basically carry the impulses for involuntary movements, muscle tone, balance, posture. The rubral spinal tract is voluntary movement of the distal parts of the upper limbs, so distal meaning further away. Tectospinal is the head, eyes, and trunk once you see or hear stimuli. The vestibulospinal is posture and balance while your head's moving. And then lateral and medial reticulospinal maintain posture and help regulate the muscle tone while you're constantly moving. This is an animation that you can you know, play with when you have time. Make sure you are in um, slideshow mode or it won't work. And, of course, you have to be connected to the Internet. Sleep versus wakefulness are integrative. These are integrative functions of the cerebrum. They're controlled by the reticular activating system, or RAS. The reticular formation is parts of the brainstem, spinal cord, and diencephalon. Um, 
and a portion of the reticular formation is this reticular activating system. So basically what it does is it acts as a system to wake you up and make you feel awake. So when the RAS is stimulated by any kind of receptor, basically, nociceptors, touch, proprioceptors, bright light, sound, whatever, it's going to send an impulse through the thalamus, and then the message is going to get dispersed all over the cerebral cortex and cause you to be in alert condition. This is responsible for waking you up from a deep sleep and basically maintaining your consciousness. So the reason that you're awake listening to this right now or watching this right now is because your reticular activating system is getting the um, appropriate signals and stimuli. During sleep, the activity of the reticular activating system is very low. So sleep is actually a state of altered consciousness or partial unconsciousness depending on how far in you are. Um, you can be aroused from sleep, of course. We have neurotransmitters that cause sleep, serotonin and norepinephrine. Each is produced by specific nuclei in the brain. We also have melatonin, which is released by our pineal gland that we will talk about in chapter 17. Or not 17, 18, endocrine system. Sorry. Um, we have two types of normal sleep, non-REM and REM. Non-REM is non-rapid eye movement sleep, and there are four stages. Rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep is where most of your dreaming occurs, and you have a very high oxygen consumption by the brain. So when you first go to sleep, you are experiencing non-REM sleep. Then you go through a period of REM. And the cycle basically lasts about every 90 minutes. Every time you go through the cycle, your REM sleep lasts longer than the previous one. And finally, memory. Memory, we have learning, which is the ability to acquire new information or skills. And this is done through either instruction or experience. And then we have memory, which is the storing of this information and retrieving this information. Now, storing and retrieval are both important to memory because if you store something but you can't retrieve it, it doesn't really matter because you have to be able to retrieve it to remember it. So both are important. Plasticity is the capability for change. So this is associated with learning. Every time you learn something, your brain actually experiences functional and structural changes. Neurons make new connections and prune themselves to make room for more connections. And it's constantly changing. So while you do not get any new neurons, the setup of your neurons, so to speak, will change because different learning requires different connections. As far as memory goes, we have immediate memory, which is extremely short-lived. It is milliseconds. We have short-term memory, which lasts longer than immediate, but is still short-lived. And then finally, we have long-term memory. That's what we want you to do. We want you to transfer the information from short-term memory to long-term memory. Now, there's various ways you can do this. You can do it through rehearsal, you know, repeating it over and over and over again. You can use mnemonics, you know, tricks, making words out or sentences out of words. Or you can do it through consolidation. You can kind of find the information that's connected and put it into maybe a story or something like that, or um, maybe put it with a personal experience or something to help you remember it, or any trick that really works for you. But I always say think about your favorite song. 
or just a song you hear on the radio constantly. You might not even like the song, but if you hear it enough, you'll know the words. You'll start singing the song simply because you heard it over and over and over again. It wasn't painful for you to learn those words. It just happened because you constantly heard it. So when you're studying for this class or any class, rehearse it, repeat it over and over again, read it out loud, get the basic concepts. That's what's very important. Amnesia, of course, is when you forget, you can't remember things. And tarot grade is you can't remember new things that happen. And retrograde is you cannot remember past events. And the kind of astonishing thing is that only 1% of what you learn is actually transferred. And even then it can be forgotten. But the important thing is if you learn the concepts, if you learn the ideas, you can still explain and understand things even without remembering all of the small things. So, for example, you know, if you learn the concepts that are associated with sensation, you can understand it and explain it without remembering what was in diagram 16.2 kind of thing. So focus on the concepts, focus on the big pictures, focus on how it is all related, and rehearse it. That is all for now. I will see you later. Bye.